All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be talking about uh, what's happening in Java. Pretty exciting times for us, so let's get started. Uh, if we can get this uh, computer screen on. Um, While we're waiting for it, how's everyone doing? All right, awesome. This is great to be here in person, isn't it? That's amazing. Uh, so let's get started uh, while they try to get up, uh, the screen uh, working. I want to talk about asynchronous programming in Java and where things are heading. But let's talk a little bit about a uh, source of confusion. A lot of us, me included, are very confused about this one aspect of uh, concurrent programming. And that is, what is the difference between parallel and concurrent uh, execution? So let's say for a minute we want to think about, you know, what does it mean to run something in parallel? What does it mean to run something concurrently? How do those two relate to each other? So I just demonstrated concurrency and parallelism to you. So I can walk and speak at the same time. I don't have to stop walking to say a few words. I don't have to pause and I can talk and walk at the same time. That's basically parallel computing. It would be really impolite and potentially really dangerous to health if I tried to drink and speak at the same time. That would be really rude. You probably know some people who can do it. I don't like those people. So I can say a few words or I can take a sip of water, but I cannot do both at the same time. However, if you give me an hour, I'm going to say a few words in an hour. I'm probably going to empty this glass of water. But within an hour, I'll do both. But at any given time, if you will, either I'm taking a sip of water or saying a word, that's basically concurrency. So parallelism is where, in both parallel and concurrent, uh, tasks continue to execute over a period of time. You're making progress on all the tasks at the same time during that interval of time. But if you draw a slice in time, at any given time, are you doing both, for example, that's parallelism. If you're doing one or the other, that simply becomes concurrency. But what's really interesting here is to go a little bit further into concurrency, we are now interested in talking about concurrency and uh, maybe uh, asynchronous programming. So what does it mean to be synchronous versus asynchronous? Synchronous programming is essentially a blocking call. Asynchronous programming is a non-blocking call. So what does it really mean to be non-blocking? Now, it's kind of obvious if you want to get a data from a database or make a request to a remote server and get some data from a server, you absolutely have to block and wait for the data. You cannot simply say, I made a request. I'm going to go off and do other things. You got to absolutely have the data. You need to get the data to do your work. So you're going to block to get the data always. So what in the world does non-blocking really mean? Well, what I want you to think about is not just the task of execution, but also the thread of execution. So typically what happens in our execution is we've been using threads all along, and we call the threads as lightweight, but the word lightweight is very relative in general. Now, what we typically do is when we make a call to a database or open a file or make a call to a remote server, the task is blocking to get the data back for it to continue doing the operation. But unfortunately, though, the thread of execution is also blocking and waiting. This is not a very effective use of the resource because when you block the thread, you cannot really perform other operations. We end up creating more threads after that. Not a very pleasant situation to be in. But we'll get back to that in just a few minutes. But let's talk a little bit about how many threads you know, should we be creating. Well, that depends on amount of memory, but also the number of cores, typically, that we have access to. But let's step back and think about this a little bit about what does it mean to be sequential? What does it mean to be parallel? Where does this take us really? Now, when it comes to programming, you know, every one of us who has ever written code, I, I can absolutely say we have written sequential code. We start learning programming by writing sequential code. A lot of us write applications where we focus on one thread. Now, you may wonder, how do I know I'm writing a sequential application. I'll tell you, it's extremely easy to know it. If you're writing sequential code, when you go to work, people actually smile at each other. 
they are friendly to each other. You go to lunch together, you actually go home in the evening. That's how you know you're doing sequential application. And you've been writing this application for a while, things are going really nicely, and then what happens? Somebody tells you one day, we got to improve performance, we got to use multi-threading. So what do you do? You throw a thread in there, now you start putting locks and synchronize, and then what happens? That's the day, the last day, there was joy at work. And everybody hates everybody else. Nobody is smiling with each other, we're all grumpy. And we spend late night evenings fixing bugs in code because it runs fast, but really terribly producing results. And you start debugging code endlessly. And one late night, while you're debugging your code, you get very angry, and you apply for this other job. That's called concurrency, right? Well, so that's not a very pleasant experience when you're writing code in concurrent mode like that. So what can we do to really make that better? So in sequential execution, of course, we are creating a program to execute. But of course, when it comes to this, what does the code really do? Let's take an analogy for a minute to think about how uh, threads have been behaving in Java. We all can agree the very first business order of business for us when we get to work is honestly to get a cup of coffee. So you go to get a cup of coffee, and you realize the coffee machine is empty, and I hope you don't do this. You don't go to the coffee machine and realize it's empty. You turn it on so it starts brewing coffee, and you just stand there and keep staring at the coffee machine, right? And your colleague comes to you and say, are you OK? Don't move. Just keep staring at the coffee machine. And they're like, if everything's OK, should we call for help? Don't move. I hope you don't do that, right? So what you do instead is you realize the coffee machine is empty. You turn on the coffee machine. It's brewing coffee. You go to your colleague and say, hey, are you ready for the you know, discussion we want to have about design? Your colleague says, I need about 10 more minutes to be ready. You go start uh, you know, the email uh, client. It's downloading a large email. You're looking at your design document in the meantime. And if I ask you what you're doing, you would say, I'm waiting for the coffee machine to get the coffee ready. I'm waiting for my colleague to start the meeting. I'm waiting for the stupid email to download. And I'm looking at this document at the same time. That's because that's you, the non-blocking you. So essentially, what you want to think about is, what does it really mean to be non-blocking? So non-blocking essentially is where you don't want to spend the time blocking your thread of execution. So your task is going to take some time to execute. And we've been blocking the thread of execution. But what if we say, let the task block and wait for it to get the results and continue further, but I'm not going to block on the thread and wait on it. We'll expand on that a little bit more as we get along. So we'll come back to this idea in a few minutes. But here is what we've been doing wrong, really. We have a thread of execution, and when the thread of execution is blocking, we say, oh my gosh, the thread is blocked. We are not able to get a response in our application. Because the thread is blocked, let's create more threads. Now think about that logically speaking. The threads don't really work very well, so let's create more of them. That is not a good news for us. But there is a community that loves this idea. Those are called the cloud providers. And the cloud providers love this idea. They're like, keep going. We'll give you more servers and clusters. And that is great because they get paid every time you launch another server. And you can create thousands of processors on the cloud. And this is great for those salespeople. Their people are playing with your people. And they're very happy with the situation. In the meantime, you're screwing the environment, we are not really being efficient in our systems, it's time for us to rethink about this. So when it comes to this, what if a task is going to take some time to execute? What can we do? We don't want to think about creating more threats just because of that, as we know that's not very efficient. So let's rethink about this idea for just a minute. Now let's take an analogy to make this a little bit easier to understand. Let's say you go to a nice restaurant, and you sit down in a restaurant. You are waiting for the waiter to come, come and you know, give you a menu. And the waiter comes over, gives you a menu, and says, what would you like to drink? And you say, hmm, I don't know what I really want to drink. What do you have on the menu? And the waiter immediately points to the menu and says, here are the types of drinks I have uh, that we have. Whatever you like to you know, order, I'll be happy to place the order for you. And you say, gosh, I'm still not sure exactly what I want to order. 
And what is a good waiter do versus a bad waiter? A bad waiter pulls a chair next to you and sits down and says, let's talk about it, and, and spends the next 15 minutes talking to you. The restaurant will probably go out of business if the waiter does that, right? Because there are other customers who are waiting to be served, and they get really anxious because their orders have not been served while the waiter is sitting next to you. What does a really good waiter do? The really good waiter says, here is all the things available on the menu, here are the drinks available, why don't you think about this for a few minutes, I'll be right back, and goes away, and serves a few other tables, and then comes back to check on you and says, what would you like, have you decided what you want to drink? While you're having your meal, maybe if you're like me, I'm drinking water, my cup is empty, and a waiter who is just walking around, you know, immediately comes and pours water, and then walks away, it doesn't matter to me which waiter actually poured the water. I am thirsty, I'm happy, I'm, I have water to drink. I'm not going to say, you cannot serve water to me, you're not my waiter. That's the best way to get kicked out of the restaurant as well, isn't it? So the point really is, a waiter in a restaurant, if you think about a waiter in a restaurant like a thread of execution, and you ordering the food and eating there is a task of execution, we typically have a really nice scalable system when you, the task, is disconnected from the waiter, the thread, and any waiter can serve you, and you can keep moving forward. So that would be a nice way to really engage with all the different resources in a system. So in order to think about this, let's think a little bit about this idea of coroutines and continuations just a little bit. This is an idea that's been around in our field for a very long time. Some of you may be programming for a few years. Some of uh, the people in this room probably have been programming for a few decades. And, and those people have been programming for a few decades. I've been programming for about 35 years right now. And one of the things I realized over time is that in, in our field, we don't have as many new ideas as much as a lot of recycled ideas. But here is something that really blows my mind. Every few decades, we'll give a new name for what we already do and get really excited about it. And people just celebrate this and you're like, oh my gosh, that's kind of weird. When I came across Amazon Lambdas, people were like, oh my gosh, Lambdas are amazing. And I'm like, when I was a kid, we used to call it data flow computing. And now they call it Amazon, uh, Amazon Lambdas, and they celebrate it. Similarly, there's a lot of these ideas that's been around for a few decades. I remember as a very young graduate student, I would read these books on computer you know, uh, 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 field in general, and honestly, I would sit there and say, whoa, these concepts are really amazing. I'm reading about these. I really wish I can use them. Well, a lot of these uh, concepts were available in esoteric languages. These languages were used in academics. They were used in a very narrow field. But most of the mainstream programming languages never had these ideas. If fast forward about three, you know, three decades or 30, 40 years later, and you look at every single language that's in use today has some of these concepts and ideas, and it's absolutely amazing. It's great for me to see my children being able to program things I only could read about in books back in time. So to me, computer science really is democratization of these technologies that what we were only able to talk once upon a time are very commonplace today. One such idea is continuations. This has been around for a very long time. Continuations have been around for maybe 30, 40 years. Most of us never had a chance to use it because mainstream languages never gave opportunity for us to use these. But let's think a little bit about this uh, to understand what these things really mean. So let's say we talk about a subroutine. A subroutine is pretty simple. You call a function, it returns a response to you. That's basically what a subroutine is. It's a function, you can call and get a response, you send an input, you get an output. Coroutine, on the other hand, is really cooperating routines. So in other words, you don't typically have a single entry point and a single exit point to a coroutine. You enter a function, you do some work, but you exit the function only to get right back into where you left. In a way, it is kind of like a conversation that you and I could 
could be having. For example, I could ask you, for example, how are you doing? He says he is fine, and I could say, how's the weather? It's Sophia like weather. I like that answer, right? Very diplomatic, right? So awesome. I like a Sophia like weather. Does it suck? Is it great? No, I don't care. It's Sophia like weather. I, li I like him already. But you just saw the co routine here. We were in a conversation. I didn't say everything and just stop. I asked a question, he gave me a response, we kind of went back and forth. That's kind of what a co-routine is. There is not one entry point, one exit point, if you will. Let's explore this idea just a little bit, if you will, to get a feel for how that actually works in here. I'm going to write a little example here in Kotlin just to get a feel for it. So I want to write a function here. And, and by the way, the people who wrote Kotlin have an uh, amazing sense of what they want to convey. They, they want us not only to program, but they want us to enjoy writing code. So that's why they called it fun when you define a function. They want you to have fun when you write code, right? So fun, let's say task one, you're going to write this right here. And within this task one, what do I want to do? I want to say print line. Let's go ahead and say in this case, entering task one, uh, let's say, and in this case, we will print out a thread.current thread, and we'll print the thread of execution right in there just to see what it's going to do. So you can see in this particular case, we have a function. We said entering task one. Similarly, we'll say uh, exiting uh, task one as well. Similarly, let's go ahead and write one more function here. And this is going to be a task two, entering task two and exiting task two as well. So then I say run, and I'm going to then say over here a task one, let's say, and we'll call the task two. And let's go ahead and print out right here, and we will say a call to the two tasks, and we will also print the thread dot, let's say in this case, the current thread as well, and we will print that information so we can actually take a look at what it's telling us. So a fairly simple code here, as you can see, nothing really exciting. So we call task one, we call task two, and we are printing out that we executed the task. So that's very simple code here, as you can see. So nothing really exciting. But I'm going to go a little further with this right here, and I'm going to say import Kotlin X dot coroutines, let's say. Uh, and in this case, well, let's go ahead and bring up not a run in this particular case, but we're going to turn it around to, let's call it as run blocking like so. So what does that do? Well, run, run blocking starts a coroutine, and it's going to block and wait for the coroutine to actually finish. So it's calling task one, calling task two, and then it's printing out that it called the two tasks. Again, nothing really different, the same output as before, a little boring, I know, at this point. However, I'm going to call this as launch like so, and I'm going to call this as a launch here as well, and you can see there is a little bit of a difference already in the output. What you notice is, notice it first on the first line it said, call the two task it says, then it says entering one, exiting one, entering two, exiting two. So what does that really tell us? It tells us that these two calls that you see here are, are really non-blocking absolutely because the thread did not wait for those to execute. It simply fired a request to task one, fired a request to task two, and executed the print line, and it's now waiting for task one and task two to finish. I want you to think about this as an analogy Think about the good old Windows program you ever wrote. Maybe a Swing application, maybe a Windows application. What did you do? If you press on a button, you don't really act on it right away. Pressing on a button, for example, would put a message in a queue, and when your task is completed, the thread will, on idle, pick up a task to execute from the queue and run. Think about this in a very similar way that your code is executing. It finishes the current work. It picks up the task one to execute, and then picks up task two to execute. So, so far, so good, isn't it? But at the same time, though, 
I want you to pay attention to the thread of execution. Notice the entire code is executing in the main thread. We are not creating multiple threads right now. It's one thread that's executing the entire code, but it ran the last line called the task2 task. It ran task1, ran task2. However, I want to get to this function again, but I'm going to call a yield function. And similarly, I want to call a yield function in both of those functions. So what does the yield function do? The yield function is just one example where it says, I am doing some work, but I'm going to take some time. I don't want to block and wait on the thread. So I'm going to yield. I'm going to let the thread go. And when the thread is done with other work, it can come back and continue further. So yield is a way for you to be really nice. Imagine the nice command in Unix. Uh, when you say nice, your process is being really nice. It gives priority to other processes to execute if they want to. Think about it in a very similar way. Now, of course, this function here is a non-blocking function. I really wish the developers of the Kotlin language thought about it a little bit when they named these things. As I said before, I really appreciate them calling it function. Imagine if they had called it non-blocking fun. That would have been amazing, isn't it? Who here doesn't want a non-blocking fun, right? That would have been amazing. But they didn't think about it, unfortunately. They gave a very poor choice of a word. They called it suspend fun. How sad that really is, right? So this is one of the requests I have for them, is to rename suspend to non-blocking. That would be really awesome. But anyway, we have a non a suspend function, and we are saying that this function is suspendable, if you will. That's basically what we have here, is we marked it as a suspend fun. So when I execute this code, however, notice the output of this code. It is very different from what we saw earlier. Notice from the output, you called the task to task. That was the very last line that executed. But notice you entered task one, but you haven't exited yet, but you have entered task two at the same time. And then you exit task one, then you exit task two. But did you notice the entire code of execution is within main, as you can see in here? So what does this particular code example show us? The code shows that we have three different tasks, for example, that we want to execute, but the thread doesn't block on executing any one of those tasks. So it called the task one, it called the task two, printed the last line of code, then it went into task one, it said entering task one, but didn't quite finish task one, the thread switched over to execute task two. In the middle of executing task two, it switched back to task one, finished the task one, and finished up task two, and it's the same main thread that's going back and forth, just like you didn't block and wait on the coffee machine while the coffee is brewing, you went on to check on your colleague, you know, opened up your mail uh, client, you were looking at the document, the non-blocking you, this is the non-blocking main. So this illustrates how the non-blocking code is working. Now, of course, this poses a bit of a challenge, if you will. For example, if I say value equal to seven, and notice I put value equal to seven right there, but in the end of this code, I'm going to print line the value right there. So when I execute the code, notice that the output shows the value of seven. However, what is really intriguing is you came into this function, you executed this line of code, and then we left the function right there only to re-enter the function right here later on. And you saw that in the output. You entered task two, but you exited task one before you exited task two. So the question is, how in the world does this code know what the value is after you left the function and you re-entered it? Now, this is an idea where Imagine for a minute that you work in an office where you, know, you don't have a specific 
a desk to work in, let's say. So just like this particular you know, uh, desk here, this is not a place where I work continuously. Maybe I speak now, maybe I come back and speak another time. But what if I really want to save something and I want to use it again? Typically what you do is at the end of your work, you gather up your stuff, maybe put it in a box, and it has your name on it. You put it on a shelf and you go away, and maybe a week later when you come back to work, you can take the box and put your stuff again and get your workstation ready, and you can move forward. So in other words, we need some way to save the data as you go back and forth. And, and I know what you're thinking in your mind, thread local. That's a bad idea, because a thread is no longer going to be the same thread that executes, for example, so how do you really make this work? This is where this idea of continuations really come in. So what are continuations? Continuations are data structures that can remember the state of a previous call and can continue from where you left off. So this is basically useful to build a conversational state. For example, I can go to this gentleman and say, what was the last question I asked you? And he's probably going to remember and say, you asked about how beautiful the weather in Sofia is. Well, how does he know this after such a long time? Well, that's a conversational state he remembers, and that basically is called a continuation. Now, here is a clue, though. You, you understand what a continuation is, but what if I tell you as a programmer, you need to be writing code with continuations? The first thing is, you're not going to like it, because that's a lot of code for you to write. And the second thing is, everybody else is not going to like it, because we're going to create bugs in code, and the code becomes hard to maintain. This is not going to be fun. So all these ideas of data structures are amazing, but you want them to work in the shadows for you. You don't want to deal with them directly in code. You want them to be there behind the scenes and do the work for you. Let's just take a look at that really quickly just to understand and appreciate this particular idea, if you will. So let's go back to this code here for a second, and let's try to write a very simple code, let's say a compute function, and where the compute function takes an integer and simply returns, let's say, n times 2. So nothing really exciting in this function, as you can see. Now let's go back over here. Let's do Kotlin C-JVM and compile this code just for a minute. Once we compile it, you can see the Java bytecode being created. Let's do Java P minus C minus V. All those options are aliases on my machine. So I'm going to say sample.class and look at the bytecode being generated only to tell you nothing exciting going on here. So here you have a compute function, as you can see. The compute is taking an integer as an input, returning an integer as an output, nothing really exciting, just as you would expect the function to be, nothing really going on. But let's go back to this function again, and this time let's change it to operate rather than compute, just to give a different name for us. So the only difference between these two functions right now is the name is different. However, I'm going to say suspend in front of that particular function. That's the only difference for all practical purposes between these two functions, as you can see. Now let's go back and compile this code one more time. Take a look at the bytecode at this time again and see what we see as a difference between those two. Once again, you notice the compute is just the way it was, takes an integer, returns an integer. However, what about the operate function? If you look at the operate function, though, notice it's taking continuation as an argument. And that's fundamentally different from the code we saw. So when you mark the function as suspend, the compiler realized that this is not a subroutine. You're not going to enter this function and exit in the end. You're going to have a conversational state with it. So automatically, the compiler interjected a continuation for you, 
quietly behind the scene. So every time this function is executed, the continuation will manage the state of the conversation for you, and it's going to work behind the scenes, which is the right way to do, because if you and I were to write this code, it's going to be error-prone, tedious, and it's going to make a mess out of what we do. But a compiler is very capable of doing it, so we enjoy the benefit of the concept without being tortured by the data structure you know, that we have to use. Life becomes really easy, if you will. So, so that kind of shows us the power of this for us. So where does this really take us? Now, again, like I said, this ideas of continuation has been around for a long time. This is not a new concept or a new idea, but more and more languages are beginning to implement it. And this is where the future of Java really comes in. So starting Java 19, we have had the uh, concept of virtual thread as a pre-release, and as of September, the uh, uh, Java 21 is going to have this as a full feature in the JVM. Now, the benefit of having this concept in Java is not only you can do this in Java, it really raises the bar for all the languages on the JVM. And, and this is where the power is going to come in. But what does it really provide for us? Let's take a look at an example of this to see what this idea provides with a little example. So let's go ahead and create right here, if you will. In this particular case, let's say we want to create a function, let's say as public static. We'll call this as a do work function. And in this function, all I'm doing is to say a try thread, let's say, dot sleep. And let's ask it to sleep for about five seconds right there. OK, maybe about two seconds, if you will. And let's go ahead and say a catch and exception, let's say ex. And we will simply go ahead and close that out. So our do work method is pretty simple, as you can see right there. Nothing really exciting. I'll give a little five second delay, but let me say over here a max is equal to a 10, let's say. And I'm going to say a far int i equal to 0, uh, let's say i less than max and i plus plus, nothing really exciting. And all I'm going to do here is to say a new thread. And let's go ahead and call the do work method. And then once we call the do work method, let's go ahead and start the thread of execution. A fairly simple code, as you can see. And then when it's done, we will output right in here that it is actually done. And we will say done right there, if you will. So a very simple code, nothing really exciting. And if I execute the code, you're going to see the done being displayed at the end of five second delay. And there you go. So that worked, not a problem. Now, what does this code actually do? Not a whole lot. What does this function do work do? Really nothing. It's sleeping. Now, imagine those of you who are uh, parents of young children. Maybe you have toddlers at, at home. Uh, if you're too young to have a toddler on your own, it could be a cousin or a nephew or a niece. And if the kid is, usually kids are very energetic, right? They run around, and you can never keep pace with them. And eventually, by afternoon, the kid says, I'm going to take a nap. OK, kids don't actually say it. They get cranky, and you kind of know they're going to take a nap. So if the kid is going to sleep, what is the worst thing you can do as a parent or as a caretaker? You say, kid, you want to sleep? Great idea. Let's sleep together. No work will ever get done. The moms and dads in the room know this, right? So what do you say? Whew, finally, you put the kid to sleep, and that's when you get your work done. Well, this thread is a very poor parent. It says, you want to sleep? Great idea, let me sleep with you. And it sleeps with the task of execution, and you know that's not going to work really well, right? So what's the problem? Notice we ran this code, not a problem. It said done. That was easy. What if I said I want 100 threads of execution? That shouldn't be really that hard either. Five seconds later, you're going to see done. That worked really well. What if I said I want 1,000 threads of execution? Hey, 1,000 is still not a big number, right? literally speaking. Five seconds later, it says done. But what if I say I want 
10,000 threads of execution. Now you can see it actually blew up on my face. What does it say? It says, out of memory error, unable to create thread, active native thread, possibly, it, it is not even sure what happened, right? Possibly out of memory, right? So what is wrong with this code? You don't do a whole lot in this code. You're just sleeping, and you created 10,000 tasks, and if you turn up the volume, you will hear 10,000 threads snoring, right? Because they're all sleeping with the task of execution. So when your task is blocking, your thread of execution is blocking with it, not a very good use of resources. This was the reality in Java that we used. So what can we do differently? Well, now Java has super lightweight threads. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Why do, we, why do they call them super lightweight threads? Well, the reason is the word lightweight thread is taken. So they have to come up with something different, so they called it super lightweight thread. Well, threads are lightweight, now you have super lightweight threads. So what are super lightweight threads? Well, these are threads that are managed by the JVM and not by the operating system directly. These are your virtual threads, if you will, that you're really creating. So virtual threads, unlike real threads, are purely managed by the uh, Java Virtual Machine, and they map over to the underlying real thread when the execution happens. However, when a task of execution is blocked, you don't want the real thread to block with it, just like that waiter in the restaurant. So when your task is blocking, your thread detaches itself and says, you can take your time to finish up and wait for the response, but let me go take care of other things for you, and then it can come back back and execute the code of execution, and you can move forward at that time. So when virtual threads are blocked, the task is waiting, but not the underlying thread of execution. So as a result, if you go back to this code, notice with 10,000 threads, we could not really execute it. So what do you typically say? If you want a lot of threads, sorry you cannot run on this machine, you need to really run this on a cluster of machines. So now we are running this on a cloud, and I'm not telling you that cloud is a bad idea by any stretch of imagination. That's not my point. But using a cloud just because your threads don't scale is not a greatest of idea, because that's not a good use of our money when we are trying to scale horizontally because the threads are not working the way they are supposed to. So in this particular case, let's get back to using 10 threads again just for a minute. As you know, this is using a regular thread. But I'm going to go back and make exactly one change to this code. So right here, as you can see, I'm going to say a thread, but I'm not going to call a start on the thread right now. And instead, I say thread.start virtual thread, and I'm going to ask it to start a virtual thread rather than an actual thread like we did in the past. So notice it says done. But what if I go back and say a 1,000 threads like I did before, and you can see in this case five seconds later, it was done, not a problem. It was able to create a 1,000 threads. What if I ask it to create a 10,000 threads? Remember, it couldn't do this earlier with regular threads. With virtual threads, that is not a problem it was able to create. What if I ask it to create a 50,000 threads rather than 10,000 threads. As you can see in this case, that was not an issue as well. What if I ask you to create 100? I feel like I'm running an auction all of a sudden here, isn't it? But I can go back and ask you to create 100,000 threads, and, and Java says, why don't you give me something a little bit more challenging? Well, OK, what if I ask you to create a million threads? Do you feel your pulse rate going up right now? You're like, oh my gosh, a million threads. Are you serious about it? So why not? Let's ask you to create a million threads right now and see what Java tells us, and you can see in this case, five seconds later, Java is like, why don't you give me something a bit more challenging? So what if I asked you to create a two million threads right now? And you can keep going with this, and you can ask the question, how many threads can I create? And the answer is very simple, 
as many as you want to. Isn't that the answer that's the right answer always, right? Like the beautiful answer he gave, how's the weather? It's Sophia-like, right? So that's exactly as many as you want to. It doesn't really matter. It depends on what you want to do. That shouldn't be the constraint by the system. So essentially, these became your operating system, operating system levels are disjoint from the virtual uh, memory uh, threads. But where does this really take us? What are we really benefiting from in this particular case, you might wonder. And the answer to that question really is, I want us to think about uh, a little bit about where we are and, and where we are going with this. Now, the threads don't have to be blocking, and what's the benefit of doing so? I want you to think about the long past of Java. In the past, what did we do? You write your code, sequential code, everybody is smiling, everybody is happy. One day you throw in threads, and what happened to your code? Your code just turned into a monster, isn't it? You no longer recognize your code. You're in this nostalgia. When we were writing code in the past, how nice the code was, what just happened to this code? So in the past, you can say the structure of, you can say, yeah, imperative uh, style, you can uh, say the sequential code, uh, uh, sequential code uh, was very different uh, from the structure, if you will, uh, from the structure of imperative style uh, parallel code. One was nice, the other was a monster. However, in you know, starting uh, you know, from Java 8, something really happened. And that is the structure, if you will, of functional style uh, sequential code, you can say is the same as the structure of uh, functional style uh, parallel uh, code. And a lot of us have you know, benefited from this. And I would say this is thanks to, what was that? That's right, the Stream API. So thanks to the Stream API, we were able to benefit from that. That was very awesome. But there's one other change that happened in Java, if you remember. So from Java 8 onwards, the structure of functional style, but you can say a synchronous code, is the same as the structure of, again, functional style. You could say a synchronous uh, a code. Uh, and, and again, this happened in Java 8, so asynchronous code. And uh, in this case, of course, thanks to, anyone wants to take a guess? No? Completable future, isn't it? So a completable future really gave us that capability. But did you notice the unfairness here? The sequential code versus parallel code is awesome if it is in functional style. But what if it's an imperative style of programming? Don't get me wrong, I love functional style of programming, but it's really hard to deal with impurities in functional style. It's really hard to write code in functional style when you have a lot of exceptions and multi-level exceptions. The code is not as pleasant to deal with. Now we have an amazing opportunity. Let's rethink about what this idea provides for us in here. So to understand this, let's go back and write a little function. We'll call it as a fetch. And what I'm going to do in the fetch is I'm going to take an index as an argument, but I'm going to output right here, let's say entering, and we will output the index plus, and we will also output the thread, let's say, dot current thread, and we will output that right there. That's entering. Then we'll put a try block and a catch block here as well for now. And let's also say over here, a length is equal to, and we will say files, let's say, dot lines, and a paths dot, let's say, get, and the sample dot Java file that we have with us, and I'm going to call that one. And once we get the data, let's go ahead and print it out right here. And let's go ahead and say, uh, we'll call it as data, or we'll call it as result, and index right there. But we'll also print out 
Well, the length is not really that you know, exciting, so we'll just say result and print that. And then finally, we will say uh, you know, catch, and we'll put the index in there. But how about putting one more here, finally, and within the finally, we'll put that as well. And instead of catch, we'll say finally. So I'm going to go back to this code, and we call that as a fetch function. Let's put a little value of 10 right there, if you will. And let's go back to this code right here. And in here, let's go ahead and say, right now, uh, in the for loop, new thread, Let's go ahead and say, in this case, an int index is equal to i. And we will call this function uh, fetch with the index given. And let's do a start on it so we can see what it's going to do. Now, clearly, you're performing an I.O. to read a file. You could be reading a file. You could be reading a database. You could be sending a request to a remote server, to a microservice, a web service. Who cares, right? You're doing some I.O. operation. That's what you're doing. When you look at the output of this code, what are you going to see in here? Let's go ahead and say this is going to be a I.O., and we'll bring in an nio.file as well right there for us to use. Let's take a look at what this code is going to tell us. Notice in this particular case, you are entering 0 with thread 0, 1 with thread 1, and, two, uh, and, and 9 with thread 9. That is easy, right? The numbers map over. They made it really easy for us. Look at the results in here. The result is 0 is thread 0. And you can see that, in this case, the result of you know, 8 is thread 8. So you kind of see the same mapping. In the finally, the 1 is thread 1. Similarly, a 0 is thread 0. So what do we infer from that? The threads are blocking and waiting for the execution of the code. And as a result, when you perform I.O., the task is blocked and the thread is blocked with it as well. That's the life we've been living so far. Let's change that a little bit and see what this is going to do. And notice, I am not changing the code in the top. The code in the top is exactly the same as it was. The only change I am making right now is to say thread.start virtual thread. And then I'm going to go back here and remove the start because we already started the thread of execution. Now let's go back here and take a look at the output of this code. You can see entering three with a pool worker four, so three and four. Look at seven, seven, and eight, so three, four, and seven, eight. Let's look at the result of seven, if you will. That's a worker three at this point. And what about the uh, entering three? So let's look at the index result three. That's a worker four again. But what about the result of zero? That's a worker two, whereas entering was a worker one. And similarly, when you look at the finally, you can see the zero was worker seven. So what does that tell us? You're not really using the same thread of execution. It's not blocking and waiting. It becomes a non-blocking. So what's the model of the story from this particular experience? We can say from Java, OK, 21, or 19, if you really want to consider that. You can say the structure of imperative style a, a synchronous code is the same as the structure of, you could say, imperative style, a synchronous code in this particular case. And of course, you can say this is thanks to uh, Project Loom, as you can see in here, or to virtual threads. So this really opens up a new area for us in terms of how we can be a lot more effective in terms of resource utilization. As a result, we are writing more and more code today that is benefiting from asynchronous calls. And this is in the right direction for Java to introduce this idea of continuations, if you will. So where does this really make sense? It makes really good sense when you are dealing with I.O. Virtual threads don't help you as much if you're doing computations because your threads are busy anyways. But if you're performing IOs, you don't have to block and wait. So this really brings up a non-blocking IO. And, and to, so to summarize, we can benefit from a lot more a better use of resources. And, and like I showed in the example of Kotlin, in Java, we're using continuations as well. And that really makes it easier for us to do better multi-threaded code with 
a greater efficiency, and that's the new world we are moving towards. I really hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for this opportunity.